You know how when they built Giza pyramids, they used two types of material. One is limestone. All these blocks from the outside are limestone. They had uh, four quarries around Cairo, which is just 10 to 20 kilometers from the uh, Giza site. Of course, the question <coughs> is if they cut them or if they pull them as some type of the ancient concrete. As a matter of fact, the gentleman who came up with the theory of pouring is an engineer, PhD, uh, Mr. Uh, Davidovitz. Joseph Davidovitz in 1984 said that actually those blocks were casted, they were pulled as a concrete blocks. Egyptologists attacked him fiercely. Finally, in 1994, when he established his own institute, Geopolymer Institute of France, near Paris, where, by the way, he tested our samples also, he has proven that uh, those blocks were cast. Why am I saying that? Because those blocks, he got two blocks from Egypt from a former French ambassador. And then he sliced them, in small slices. And then uh, he made the chemical analysis. And what he realized was that uh, it was not pure limestone, but there were two more elements that he could not find anywhere close by. And those two elements happen to be additives to make those blocks harder. So his conclusion, material was melted, limestone, natural material, combined with the additives and you got very hard concrete blocks, geopolymer blocks as he called them. That was first material for Egyptian pyramids. The second one was granite. Now there is a big source of granite in Aswan which is 880 kilometers to the south. And the biggest block from granite in the Great Pyramid of Egypt is 80 tons. It is in one of the chambers. The biggest one in the Kefren or Kafre Pyramid is 220 tons. Now imagine you have to move 220 tons from Aswan. You cut it in the quarry, you need to move it to the river Nile if they use River Nile, and then 880 kilometers, cataracts, and then move it to the desert, and then install it, you know, somewhere 50 meters above the ground. That was actually an infrastructure nightmare. <coughs> 220 tons even for us today would be great, great challenge. When the Japanese tried to make the replica of the whole process, uh, 30 years ago, what they did, they cut just one ton block, one ton. And they uh, <coughs> make a barge, like a little wooden boat, which was based on Egyptian hieroglyphic symbols. They placed this block and the barge sunk on the bottom of the Nile. If they could not explain one ton, how they will explain 220 tons? Now the question is, of course, who really moved them, who really built pyramids, when they were actually built. Today you're going to hear some answers. Obviously, not primitive people, not slaves, not ropes. It was another answer. Well, guess what? Instead of 880 kilometers, the Bosnian pyramid builders had all their materials within three kilometer circle from here. Because the Ravne tunnel entrance, two and a half kilometers. Clay, 500 meters. So they were much more practical. Granite, they used dust, is just four kilometers from here. So everything was here. <coughs> now, when we were uh, behind the highway, a few minutes ago looking at this northern side, we could see that it has triangular face. There it is on that uh, billboard in front of me. Now we are bottom left. In the forest, but you see different color than the green, it's like light brown color. So, looking, sunny, steady too, sunny, Krishna sunny, seven two yet. Hello, how are you guys? So, 
triangular face, compass showing this side perfectly oriented. What is the next element we need to prove that we have artificial structure below the layers of soil? And I had a question here, how was that? What was the first section that you discovered? Well, this was the first section here on the northern side. At that time, everything was covered by soil and vegetation, going all the way down. Forget those signs, forget the road, nothing was here. Just uh, neglected forest. And then the way how we uh, picked up the location where we're going to work is, was such. We're going to be digging on all four sides at different heights. And in every section, if we find construction material, then the logical conclusion is everything is covered by that construction material. This was our section number 4C. 4A, 4C, 4B. And uh, we started removing the soil, about one, one and a half meter. And this was the first block that we discovered. So now imagine, April of 2006, we started digging, after one meter, exactly like I thought it would be, we hit this block. We uncovered it and realized it was rectangular in shape. So it's a regular shape. You see this side is about four and a half meters. It is one and a half meter wide. It is 45 centimeters thick. Seven tons, 16,000 pounds in mass. And look, we have break at 90 degrees here, 90 degrees, break at 90 at the bottom, six times flat sides, six times breaks at 90 degrees. Mother Nature has not made this block, but intelligent man. Who would expect that after, you know, that below the bushes and soil, soft material, you hit such a hard rectangular block. Next to this one, we were expanding our section, we discovered another block, here it is, and another one, and another one. And where I'm standing right now, the block is obviously missing, and it is right there. It slipped. So, this was the first row of blocks. And look at below, there is another block. The second row of blocks second layer. And look at here, the third layer. And there is the fourth layer below. One, two, three, four. This is a structure. Mother Nature does not construct, <coughs> but intelligent hands. We were very, very happy and excited about this discovery. As a matter of fact, just a couple of days later, I invited press corps to come here and I did press conference here. That day was rainy and slippery. No stairways, no nothing. So people were kind of climbing and falling and getting <laughs> dirty from the mud. But they came here and I actually had my first press conference from the pyramid right here. And my wife-to-be was standing here. I was looking at her beautiful blue eyes, and you're going to see her in a few days also, Sabina. She was a journalist, and we didn't know each other, she was there. <laughs> and I'm looking at her eyes, beautiful blue eyes. And after the press conference, she's still there, I said, listen, your two blue eyes are like two blue lakes. Those who don't know how to swim, they're going to get drowned. <laughs> well, it turns out that I was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I, never, I never tell these stories, but I guess. <laughs> well, anyway, so this was the first section, and we discovered the concrete. I'm sorry, I, didn't, I, didn't, I shouldn't say concrete, because that's what comes later. But we have artificial construction material because of the shape. Now, look at the, what these blocks consist of. You see those stones? Some of them are a little bit bigger, medium size, small, different sizes. Some of them are whatever, white and gray and blue and uh, brown, there are some red ones and yellows, different colors. When we go to the tunnels, you will see that uh, they built tunnels in the conglomerate. Conglomerate, river conglomerate, is actually this. Stones of different sizes and different colors. So when they were digging, 
they removed a lot of material to make this underground labyrinth. What did they do with this? They brought it right here. All they needed was the binding material. This brownish material, clay. And some other supplements, some other additives. So, we sent those samples to seven different institutes for materials. Politecnico di Torino in Turin, Italy, to their chemical lab. Geopolymer Institute in France. I gave my sample directly to Professor Joseph Davidovic. Davidovic. After my lecture, he said, call me Joseph, we are friends now. Then to Czech Republic, Slovakia, Bosnia. They all told us this was a concrete, artificially made concrete. Some people call it, like Professor Davidovic, geopolymer concrete. Some people call it synthetic concrete. Just to emphasize its artificial origin. Because Mother Nature does not make, you know, stuff like this. Now, when it comes to concretes, you can determine the quality of concrete based on two elements. The first element is the hardness. Harder the material, more durable, better quality. In the last century, 20th century, our best concretes were on the scale from 10 megapascals to 60 megapascals. 60, best quality, made in Germany, made in USA. When the, the biggest skyscraper in the world was built, they had to come up with much stronger concrete. And that uh, biggest skyscraper would be, which one? Burj Khalifa. Khalifa in Dubai. So big. The concrete hardness was <coughs> 115 megapascals. <coughs> 150. Well, when we analyze these samples here, actually we analyzed 50, 5, 0, 50 samples from here. They were in the range from 73 megapascals to 134. 134 we cannot make without technology. So they had formulas that we've lost and forgotten a long time ago. How to make the best quality concrete. The second element for concrete, especially in the climate like this, is the water absorption. If water can get inside the concrete during the winter, it freezes. Now you have ice. Ice has a tendency to expand and concrete breaks. <coughs> so our norms today up to 3%. This concrete here, 1%. So, superior concrete to what we can make even today. Well, if it is so superior, how come we have so many smaller pieces here? Now look at the pyramid, look at the slope. It's like 30 degrees going up. At 30 degrees, you cannot do any agriculture, obviously. You cannot keep your domestic animals, obviously. So from the farmer's perspective, this was worthless. Mm -hmm. Very cheap, nothing. So below us, probably when you were driving the van, maybe you, you could see on your left the gypsies village. Gypsies. They got the land basically for nothing. Now they need to build their houses, no money for the construction material. They would come here, this was the government land, it still is. They would dig a little bit, they found those big blocks, they thought it was just a natural stone, rocks. And since this guy is like seven tons, they cannot move the seven tons and put it in his foundation. So they would come with the dynamite. Where they get dynamite? There are many coal mining facilities around us, in the cities like Kaka, and Varesh, and Zenit, and so So they're getting dynamite. They would bring the dynamite, blew everything out. They were getting smaller pieces. Now, smaller pieces they could use as the construction material in their primitive houses, walls, foundations, and so on. So, unfortunately, like this section here, completely destroyed. The section below, the private property. Half of the town of Visoko were coming here to quarry the material. Quarry meaning, you know, dynamite this material. We purchased that property and we could see that 95% of the property of the stone, of the rocks were gone, gone. They were selling it. People as a construction material. 
Well, anyway, you know, when we came here uh, in 2005, 2006, we asked the government and municipality to stop this process, which was stopped because, of course, of our project. So that's about the hardness and finally about the age. I will talk about it uh, tomorrow and tonight, but just to give you an idea. You see how the pyramid is covered in soil? Well, we have analyzed soil. The science that investigates the origin of soil is called pedology. In Bosnia we have Institute for Pedology. They took samples from the Sun and from the Moon Pyramid. And their conclusion, which they presented at our first scientific conference about Bosnian pyramids in 2008, their conclusion was that the age of the soil is between 12 and 15,000 years. So if the soil is the, yeah. is the cover is 15,000, it means that the structure below be is much older. Mm -hmm. Of course it is older because it is below. But why am I saying much older? Well, if you have this slope surface, you have concrete blocks. So, of course, wind can bring some dust, and, but the next rain will wash out this dust that came in the middle. So it took a long time for the dust and the soil and vegetation to start growing here. So we knew that it was much older. And then in 2012 we had our uh, Italian archaeologist uh, Nicola Bisconti with the crew of the volunteers on that trench number 4A. We're going to go there later. And uh, I was there that day when they were removing the soil and then on the concrete blocks we could see some brownish material. Hello, hi, how are you? Hello. Where are you coming from? I'm from Australia. Australia? Thanks a lot. <laughs> we have another girl from Australia here. She's between uh, Melbourne and Sydney. Where are you from? Which city? Melbourne. Melbourne. Good. Thanks for coming. And you are? I'm from Hungary. From Hungary. Nice. Thanks for joining. Okay. We have international group here. Australia and US and Canada and Switzerland and Serbia. Then what else? Poland. Poland. Yeah. Huh? Croatia. Croatia. Yes, Croatia. <laughs> exactly, Croatia. So go back to our uh, dating. So we found that piece of the brownish, obviously organic material. So we sent it to the lab for the radiocarbon dating. It produced results of 24,800 years plus minus 200 years. So we, we go back for 25,000 years. But it was on the surface, meaning it was a minimum age. Then finally, next, the following year, 2013, our team from New Zealand, Tim Moon and his crew of volunteers, our trench number 13, it's 150 meters from here, between two concrete blocks, between the layers, we discovered fossilized leaves, which you're going to see tomorrow in our museum. We did the carbon dating, and that was very important because it was between the layers. What does that mean? It means that... Uh, Somebody was laying the first row, the second, the third, the wind was blowing, bringing those leaves, and then they finally placed the final row. But those leaves are organic material. You can date it. The age, 29,200 years, plus minus 400 years. So radiocarbon date is almost 30,000 years. But this is not calibrated date. This is not calendar age. Calendar age you need to add about 14-15%. So the real age is about 34,000 or 33,600. 34,000. What does that mean? What they teach us in schools is that everything started with Sumerians 6,000 years back. Encyclopedia Britannica, Sumer. Then 5,000 years back, Babylon, Akkad, Assyria, Hittite, ancient Egypt, ancient Egypt. But, of course, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica and everyone else on national levels, including uh, non-scientific sites fully controlled like Wikipedia, they are wrong. This is just the last civilizational <coughs> cycle which did not start 6,000 years, like they claim. The last cycle started 11,500 years after the end of the last Ice Age. It started in... Uh, you know, what is today we call Israel, Palestine, Territory, and Jordan. You know, the, those huge stone towers in Jericho. 
Anybody went there? Jericho? Huge tall towers, 20 meters high. Then we have Yarmoukian culture in Israel also, central Israel. Today I'm going to show you some figurines from the Yarmoukian culture. But this is just the last cycle of humanity. Before this one there was another one, which ended 12,000 years back with a huge catastrophe known as the end of the last ice age. At that time, uh, everything north from Austria in Europe was covered by ice. No Switzerland, no Germany, no Poland, no France, no Scandinavia. Ice was reaching 2,000 meters, two, two kilometers, thick layer of ice. Northern Asia, ice. Northern North America, ice, 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 ice. 12,000 years ago, something happened, most probably the huge cosmic catastrophe. Origin of that catastrophe, natural or artificial, it's another uh, set of problems. But after that catastrophe, the ice started melting. Huge quantities of water went to the world, seas and oceans. Pacific went up for 80 meters. Atlantic, 120 meters. Little Adriatic Sea here, 750 meters. And tsunamis were reaching, uh, I mean, big, big heights. Talking about tsunamis, the last big tsunami, uh, most of us remember, December 2000, uh, and uh, four, Indonesia, remember the big earthquake, tsunami? It was 25 meters high. Now this uh, pine tree is about, well, it's about right, 25 meters high. Remember the power of the water. 225,000 people got killed. Quarter million people got killed. 25 meters. Tsunamis, 12,000 years back, were reaching 2,000 meters. <laughs> It's unimaginable. Uh, somebody mentioned Bolivia. Where is David? Not here. Yeah. Ah? He went back? Well, anyway. We had a person from Bolivia today in front of the tunnels. There is a lake Titicaca between Bolivia and Peru. A lake Titicaca, salt water. Almost 4,000 meters above the sea level. From that tsunami. If you have 2,000 meters, so uh, earthquakes, unimaginable scale. Our scale 1 to 12, forget about it, it was probably 15 or 20. The civilization before that was lost, we can call them long, uh, lost land of Atlantis, Moria, Motherland, Mu, Ug, that's far off. They are gone, 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 gone. So people had to start from all over. These pyramids belong to the previous cycle, even before that one, because 12,000 years, the last catastrophe, before that 18,000 years, before that 32,000, 55, 75,000. So in the last 100,000 years, we had five such huge catastrophes that would destroy whatever humanity achieved. 99% in most cases of humans were wiped off from the face of the planet. They are teaching us in schools, our history is this, evolution. 10,000 years back, we were primitive came in, today we are the most developed, the most intelligent, the most beautiful. <laughs> well, we are not. We are just on the cycles. And uh, humanity is cycle after cycle after cycle. That's another thing why conventional science does not like it. As a matter of fact, you have always warm periods between cycles and uh, you, uh, dominantly we have ice ages with warm periods from 4, 5, 8 to 12,000 years. And guess what? We are at 12,000 years right now. So the next thing we are expecting is not global warming, it will be the next ice age. And this is the natural cycle which you cannot prevent. So how much time we have left? Not much sense of just a few generations maybe, a few hundred years, or around the corner. But anyway, so when we come to the age, uh, like I said, we're talking about 3-4 thousand years, long before any known civilization and everything that was left from them in writing. The only thing that survived are the stone structures. We take Gobekli Tepe, which I will mention today, it is not 11,600 like Wikipedia is uh, saying, it is officially 13,800 to so the radiocarbon dating, 
but most probably 15 to 18 pounds. Machu Picchu, the first structures there, they are not royal retreats for Incas. Incas were the fourth cultural layers before that, 2000, 8000, 55, so 55,000 ago back in the past, and so on and so forth. So, those stuff survived, blocks survived, the stones survived, the pyramids very often survived. In our case, today we are talking about five pyramids, most probably seven, but potentially we had dozens of smaller pyramid structures, temples, terraces and so on. But smaller structure, not so strong, they were washed away. So this was a story about this part, now we're going to go and see one more section over there. On our way back we're going to see one section here and then we go back to the van. Alright? Over there you can ask questions or we can do some activities as well. So, we can see some of the bigger rocks, medium size, and a lot of small ones. And again, different colors. And you see, when due to the tectonic movements of earthquake, or even during the last fall, this pyramid was shelled, it was bombed by the Serbian army. When the shell would hit the pyramid, of course there are some displacement of the rocks and the blocks. And you see when the block breaks, sometimes it goes through the rock, which is extremely hard. It's not through the binder, through clay, but through the rock. Meaning the binder originally was of extremely good quality. Now let's see how they made this section. Over there we could see rectangular blocks. Here, it seems that they pulled the section here. You see the straight line here? They pulled one section. And then they pulled the second section. You see the straight lines? The second one goes a little bit below the first one. And then they pulled the third section third going under the second one. Then they pour the fourth section, fourth going under the third one. Again, a series of steps. Why would you do that? For structural stability. If it was like this or like that, in case of earthquakes, it would collapse. So it doesn't make some sense. Also here on the sides, you can see a lot of crystalline structures, coarse crystal on the sides. We need to come. Crystal, extremely important. We are finding crystals from so many other places. When we started clearing this section, we started exactly where you are right now. It was about 2 meters by 2 meters. That's what you do in archaeology, smaller sections. And then every year, we would extend to the left, to the right. And right now we have from one end to another one about 50 meters, and then 70 meters going up. This is unusually large section in archaeology. But then this is unusually large pyramid. Now, it is on the government land right now. In 2006 we had permission to work here. And then people who were signing petition against us, when they realized that we are actually discovering the proof of the pyramid, what they did, they used one of their commissions, Commission for the National Monument Preservation. They changed the law, and uh, from one very small protected zone on the very top, and the top is 450 meters from here, 1500 feet. From that, they expanded protected zone for 97 times. And everything that was on the government property became part of the protected zone. So now, here, we cannot walk anymore. As a matter of fact, the border is somewhere like there, going down, and so on. Why would they do that? Would it be more logical that if you are in a cultural establishment and you have the biggest discovery to support it? Don't ask me that. This country operates on different principles. People do stuff that are not rational and not logical. Probably in order to hide their lack of knowledge because
because they are saying there is nothing there, don't let him work. All of a sudden, there is something there, something real big. These people, they know what they are doing. They were very embarrassed. And really, the public, like 60-70% of the people were very supportive of this. They were really attacking the media and everything. Well, anyway, that aside, so we cannot work here. The only thing that we can do, we clean it, you know, from the vegetation. And now we work below and on eastern slope. The last section that we open is actually right there. And if you want, you can go and see that section also. This one has been damaged. This piece where Sunny is laying, there was a big, actually the big tree here. The big tree, the roots were going under, so they kind of destroyed, how, you know, some part. But, look at this block. The side was going like this. Like that, following the straight area, following the straight up to here. And then the second section, going this way, this was the corner, and that way, the corner coming down. So let's measure this block. One, two, three, four, four and a half meters, 13 feet. Four and a half meters. Four and a half, four and a half. Square. Square block. This one, square block. So we have square blocks here. Rectangular, square here. Now let's calculate the mass. This is the formula. Four and a half meters by four and a half, that's 20.25 square meters. 20.25. You take the thickness. The thickness is about 80 centimeters. 80 centimeters times 20.25, that will be 17 cubic meter. 17 cubic meter, that's a volume. You are getting mass when you multiply, multiply volume by specific weight specific weight of this material about 2.5 more iron bigger specific weight we don't have iron here so we said 20 did we say 20 uh, cubic meters 20 cubic or 18 18 cubic meters times 2.5 will be 45 tons 45 tons now, obviously they did not cut them and move them here, they were pour them. It was much more practical, of course. 45 tons. This is big. These are, you know, megalithic structures. Tens of tons. And then we were continuing <coughs> moving and you see how the blocks continue. Here, also the straight line. Huge tree was here. More concrete, concrete, straight lines, concrete, concrete, concrete. And then the law was changed. We were not allowed to dig no more. All right. This is what I had for you for the Sun Pyramid. Of course, to check all other sites, they are much smaller, usually 2 by 2 or 5 by 5 meters. But we were finding concrete everywhere else on three sides, east, west, and north. On south side, now south side is a different story. We don't have flat, preserved side like this one here. On south, the blocks are missing. Why? We could see geological crack between the sun and the love pyramid, crack. Meaning there was a huge earthquake or tectonic movement in the past, which caused that concrete blocks from southern face collapsed. Without the concrete and only with clay, the soil was accumulating and sedimenting 10 meters in height till there. So the southern face is not flat like three other sides, but more like rounded. So when you look at the pyramid from above, you see three flat and one 
rounded side. So this is what I had for you on the Sun Pyramid. Do you have any questions? Yes. So those blocks with the height are they getting any smaller or they are uh, the same size? Actually over there, there are some smaller blocks. Mm -hmm. How about after that? I don't know. And the one on the bottom that you are digging, are they bigger than those? Now, I'm calling them blocks because here the straight sides are rather obvious. But sometimes, like in that section, number five, they would simply come and pour bigger sections, sometimes huge sections. So here they look more like blocks. Over there, rectangular, seven tons, very regular, sometimes rather irregular. So there is no like. Um, you know, um, form how they did it. it. It looked to me like either different groups of people were doing different sections or they didn't care much about regularity and the look, but they did care about the hardness of the material. Mm -hmm. Very important, hardness. And this is not conductive material. Now, when it comes to the pyramid, we have three different energy flows. This is a pyramid. The first one is like a spiral going through the top of the pyramid. And we're going to discuss that. This is an energy beam. The second one is the energy flow within the pyramid. But this energy flow is hitting one third of the height, going up to two thirds, coming back to one third, and then completing the circle. And we are now at the one-third of the height. So these are the areas where this energy was kind of hitting and then coming back. So it seems that they wanted to make sure that using this non-conductive material, Stay energy inside. will be going back and stay within the pyramid. Mm -hmm. And the third energy flow is off the pyramid, on the ground, affecting societies, agriculture, and so on. Mm -hmm. I do have one question. Yes. Is there any argument, since we have um, telegraph, uh, like electricity-wise here, have this protected? Why are they here? Like uh, they're here beforehand, but is that an argument? Why they place them over here? Yeah. Back in the 1970s, they got this uh, electrical pole here, and they were saying at that time they were trying to oh. dig through the, this oh. material. They could not. No. Their machines. They were all broke, they could not go through. So at that time nobody knew about the pyramid thing, so they didn't care. For them it was interesting because it has like a commanding position, so they were getting those electrical cables from one side, northern, no. over there to eastern. Mm. Would that affect, um, would that affect like, the energy? Of course it does. Mm -hmm. Look at the tower. Uh, concept of energy. Our concept is based on, when it comes to resources, on coal, dirty industry, oil and gas, limited resources, nuclear, go from Chernobyl to Fukushima, how much damage we did to our planet. When it comes to resources, everything is wrong. So finally, when we start producing the electricity, we are making up the voltage. In the Bosnia and Europe we use 220 volts. Mm -hmm. The US is 110. You touch the loose wire, it kills you. Mm -hmm. And this is the frequency that we are producing. When you talk on the phone, 5 gigahertz, it burns your brain cells. Mm -hmm. The ancients were actually through pyramids, I explain it in the details, amplifying existing natural sources and natural frequencies. They were smart. So yes, this here is damaging the energy of the pyramid, unfortunately. Is uh, anything known about the interior of the pyramid? Uh, chambers or entrances? Yes, something is known. They will hear during the lecture 4 o'clock. So in your opinion, is there any clues who might have built like some most human civilization or what? I cannot give you all the answers today. <laughs> Most of them you'll get during my lecture. We'll talk about the builders. Five questions in archaeology. Who, when, how, why, and the first one is what? What is this? And then by who, when, and so on.
Again, we came to the layers of concrete. Concrete. Now here, they use much more of the sandstone material. Sandstone is another local type of stone. Again, they were mixing it with the rocks from the tunnels. Sandstone. When we first opened this section, we have discovered a lot of quartz crystal and white crystal. So on the poster there, these are the photos from, I would say, November 2017, when we first opened it. And look, sometimes we are finding even bigger pieces of crystal, like this one here. Everything was so shiny when we first opened it. The bigger pieces, unfortunately, they disappeared. People come, they take those pieces. So we are getting closer to the edge, to the corner. This is north. East is there. And uh, it seems that in some other cases, like some of the Egyptian pyramids, a lot of quartz crystal and crystal like material were you know, focused, concentrating very close to the edges. Probably it had to do something with the you know, energy flows in the pyramid. Of course, crystal, as we know, has an ability to transform the energies from one form to another. For example, we measure a lot of electromagnetic fields here. I'll talk about it during the lecture. Electromagnetism hitting quartz crystal. Through the piezoelectric effect, we are getting ultrasound. Electromagnetism to ultrasound. Or mechanical energy to electricity. You know, you're doing your barbecue, you hit the button there, it squeezes the crystal, and it you know, sends the electricity and this is how we are you know getting fire in our barbecues, barbecue pits. Okay that's that's what I had for you. Now we can go back, we can go I think it's easier this way.